It's number one. It's the number one gathering of Alaskans. And we call it our Native New Year. Every year, the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention packs one heck of an economic punch. And we take you to Ketchikan to meet one of the keynote speakers at AFN, a Haida weaver who works magic with both spruce roots and young people. The hood, and that's what I usually start with. Husbuck's more than a fashion statement, an outward expression of history and culture, the story behind this remarkable piece of clothing. <laughs> also, how Canadian throat singers give voice to the past and present. Ship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builder Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come, bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride, Welcome to our program. Sometimes frontiers are neither recognized nor fully appreciated by the public at large. And that may be the case with the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention, which gets underway in Anchorage this week. Although it's the state's largest convention, many Alaskans know little about it, but that's something we hope to change in this program. The impact is significant. Alaska's largest gathering brings thousands to the host city, which is rotated between Anchorage and Fairbanks. That influx of people pumps more than $6 million into the economy. Now, those are numbers calculated using national standards to gauge how convention dollars flow into the economy. But some economic experts say the impact may be even bigger because of some of AFN's unique circumstances. Even before AFN delegates fill up the Denina Center, Anchorage businesses have already begun to experience a windfall. The formula is simple. Permanent fund dividends plus AFN convention goers add up to a big boost for the economy. But it really goes deep into the retail side, much deeper than any other conference that comes to Anchorage. That was AFN's message to the Anchorage Chamber of Commerce. They're not like other shoppers or people who come in as tourists from out of state because when they come to Anchorage, they're buying bulk. <laughs> they're going to clean out the stores. And that's what makes AFN visitors different from tourists who may go out to eat or buy a few souvenirs, which AFN goers do too. But unlike tourists, they're also stocking up for winter. Even though it's only been a couple days, you can, you can definitely see that it's kind of picked up a little bit. They'll come in and they'll buy case quantities versus buying one or two cans like our normal customers will do. So we'll see cases leave the store at one time. All this comes at a good time for downtown businesses, delivering rural PFD cash right to their doorstep. It definitely gets us through the, the slump in the winter time. AFN is a bridge between the summer tourist season and the holidays. And it's been very popular since we've had it in. Phaedra Lampshire has worked at Octopus Inc. for four years. That it's all um, native inspired. And, and then, sees believe, repeat business beyond the store itself. With the advent of the internet and our ability to ship all over Alaska, we have Bush customers who order from us all the time. I just filled an order from Cloak. Is that, I think? <laughs> Places with those unfamiliar names, with people who have money to spend. I am very happy to see you. <laughs> that means I get to work another year. It's good for Anchorage. It's just bottom line, it's just good for Anchorage. Bruce Bustamante says Anchorage needs to do a better job of showing its appreciation for AFN because the city will be better off for it. If we can do the best we can, and make AFN a very good experience for Alaskans and for people that, that attend, then that really puts us in a good competitive position to host other large conventions. It seems what's good for AFN is also good for Anchorage. It's, it's number one. It's the number one gathering of Alaskans. In recent years, Anchorage has been in competition with Fairbanks to host the convention. AFN leaders say the Golden Heart City is 
very welcoming. Now the schedule, or rather the convention is scheduled to move there in 2016, partly because next year is AFN's 50th anniversary and Fairbanks is where it was first held. Well, every year AFN has a theme, and this year it's Heroes in Our Homeland. AFN says it's meant to recognize the accomplishments of unsung heroes across Alaska who every day make a difference in the lives of others. From the veterans who served in the military to single mothers uh, serving their families, foster parents, grandparents raising their kids, uh, subsistence hunters and fishermen. Now there's a contest asking people to send in their stories, pictures, and videos of their personal heroes. And the grand prize winners will be announced at the convention and receive airline tickets. Well, one of the heroes in the homeland, this year's keynote speaker at AFN, a Haida elder who not only weaves with spruce roots, but also interweaves words of wisdom. Heather Hinsey traveled to Ketchikan to talk with Dolores Churchill about her message for this year's gathering. Actually, it usually is the other way around. Usually the spider web is on top. Every so weaving has a story. In the morning, when the sun was shining on the slime, it sent up rainbows. So the moral to that story with Haida's is there's always beauty in what it, in things that you see, look for it. 85-year-old Dolores Churchill is the storyteller. She's created dozens of intricate traditional pieces in her time as an artist. It's actually uh, Simpson style and it rep represents cresting waves. Dolores took up weaving later in life after she turned 40. She made her living as a bookkeeper for the hospital before delving into the ancient art form. When you become an artist, you may not realize you have taken a vow of poverty. <laughs> and so, yeah, I didn't take it until after my children were grown. Her daughters and granddaughters now practice it too. As keynote speaker at AFN this year, Dolores hopes to inspire a new generation to take up the craft. Because spruce root is a, a weaving that there's maybe five or six people doing it in all of Southeast Alaska. And I'm, I'm hoping that young people realize that it's really endangered. She'll share the stage with her grandson, Donald Varnell, a Haida carver. I think that it's going to be a lot of fun because he's, he, you know, it won't be serious like mine would be because he has such a sense of humor. The goal is to showcase how traditions are handed down between the generations and why it's crucial to keep up with traditions. And it's a beautiful art form. And I think that if young people don't keep it going, then we're going to lose something that's so important to our culture, and our culture is important to us. For Dolores, it's and an honor to share her story basket. and her artwork with the Native community around it. Alaska. These are a collection of my baskets. For Frontiers, I'm Heather Hintze in Ketchikan. Up next, we continue the conversation about AFN with seasoned observers, veteran Native journalists Nellie Moore and Jocelyn Estes. And we look at the history of the ultimate all-Alaskan garment, which comes in many colors, shapes, and sizes. Thanks to these photos from our viewers, you can see what we mean. Enjoy. Spenard Builders Supply, we're thinking about color a little differently. Our Voice of Color touchscreens help you select just the right shade to bring your ideas to life and life to your ideas. Discover your perfect color. Find it at SBS. Interior and exterior paint, quality supplies, and unmatched expertise. Shop our inspired and exclusive Alaska Color Collection, named by fellow Alaskans, only at SBS. We have a story, a story of 27 families that put 18 months of their lives into building a village, a home for themselves and their future. Our Inupiaq culture goes back thousands of years, carried by a strong sense of community. Our relationship with our natural surroundings is at the heart of our culture. 
by investing in future generations through development that is balanced with the love of our land, the Kupi Corporation brings together traditions of the past with visions of the future. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium provides comprehensive health services for Alaska Native and American Indian people across our state. In addition to world-class care at the Alaska Native Medical Center, our work delivers health services for rural Alaska. From cutting edge technology for the best care possible, to modern construction of clean water systems and health clinics, to health training and outreach that honors our culture, our vision is that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. This fire roared to life yesterday around 1 p.m. It took a lot of people by surprise. They That's grabbed. where I like to be. I like to be where things are happening, where, where people are. That's just how I am. I just don't want to sit around behind a desk. I mean, I think it's important to actually be out there telling the stories from where the stories are happening. We're about exceptional journalism, and I think we've really proved that. I think we're working hard every single day to achieve that, and that's what you're going to get. One thing that expands AFN's footprint, it's broadcast live on ARCS TV and GCI Cable Channel 1. And there is even an app that you can download the schedule. And it's also broadcast live on public radio. And our two guests have played a huge part in that over the years. Jacqueline Estes, News Director for KNBA, which provides radio coverage live of the convention. And Nellie Moore, who has covered AFN for many, many years. So great to have you here. But you know, for our viewers who may not understand what AFN is all about, maybe we should start with some explanation. AFN 101. <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting watching Bruce Bustamante because some people don't know um, the numbers involved of the people who come for AFN. It's quite a footprint. Yes. And um, just quickly, 165 tribes are members. Some opt in or out, so, you know, the number does change periodically. 146 village corporations, um, 12 regional corporations and uh, 12 regional and nonprofit corporations that perform some kind of uh, health or other services like ANMC. The Alaska Native Medical Center. You know, it's kind of overwhelming when you go to the Denina Center, the wall-to-wall -wall people. What is it that people are coming for? Well, I think it's uh, a lot of different things. Part of it, 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 AFN started when people came together to fight for land claim settlement. And then it continued, I think, as an, an important educational forum where you can hear speakers, federal, state, the congressional delegation, tribal leaders, people, statewide leaders, come in and talk about issues affecting Alaska Natives. So it's an educational forum. In the evening, you can watch dance groups. There's also an incredible arts and crafts oh, fair. Boy. And all of this is open to everybody. It's open to the public. And I don't think people realize that, that they can just go in and and be a part of AFN. And, and one of the things I find so fascinating are the amazing speeches that I've heard over the years. One stands out, Will Mayo, uh, encouraging people to take an interest in every child in their community. How about you guys? What, what, what is the, the moment for you that sticks in your mind? Well, I remember after uh, Lisa Murkowski ran for the U.S. Senate as a write-in candidate, and the Native corporations and tribes, the Native community came together and really turned out the vote to get her elected. And her thank you speech at the banquet at the end of AFN was really moving. And, and the crowd was just exultant that we, you know, we had done this. Through the ballot box, the Through power the ballot box. of the Native vote. How about you, Nellie? It's, it's hard to pick one. Um, I know in Fairbanks, when uh, John Schaefer Sr. touched on a... And he's a, from Kotzebue. Yes. And uh, he was the head of NANA Regional Corporation for many years, and as well as a former adjutant general of the Guard. But um, he announced that he was an alcoholic and that, you know, he was changing his life and encouraged, you know, others to deal with that issue, which has long been a topic of discussion in our health related communities. And um, the talk about subsistence, Katie John, some of those just the big a lot lawsuit. of really, really important topics that have come across AFN's podium mm -hmm. for many Sometimes years. Sometimes it can move you to tears, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, when the kids from Tanana spoke the year before last, I think uh, everybody was 
it's, it was very powerful. These were kids maybe from the age of eight into their early teens who came and talked about the abuse and alcoholism and drug, drug, drug abuse and violence that they were experiencing in their lives and said, you know, called out to the delegation, to the, to to do the audience something. to do something. I remember that was very powerful. Now, now, when we're on the subject of kids, you know, there is the Elders and Youth Conference, and we should probably talk about that a little bit. That's something that came later, but now it's a big part of the build-up to AFN. Can you talk about how that has helped the convention grow? I think part of it has become uh, nurturing for, you know, potential future leaders, and they touch on important topics and as well as topics that are important to young people today, which are, of course, different than what some of us are thinking about. But um, it's become a way for them to meet leaders, to be um, coached, to get insight into what it is that they do at the AFN convention. There's a lot of background negotiating going on in the caucuses over how to vote for maybe... Leadership next, training. Yeah, the next AFN chairman or um, how to vote or deal with a certain type of negotiation in the legislature, all now, of those. Now, you have seen this through your own family. Mm hmm And we were just talking about it earlier that um, through the school district, uh, young kids are going to be coming into the convention through um, in the Indian Ed program here in Anchorage, probably from the villages too. But um, my grandson was so excited because I'm always grandson. <laughs> yeah, I'm always dragging them to AFN so they help at our table and stuff like that. But um, very excited to be attending officially as uh, a young native, and I'm, it just thrills me to death. Well, what about you, Jocelyn, as far as uh, elders and youth go? Have you seen uh, the impact of, of that gathering? Well, I think um, part of it is that the kids get to uh, see positive role models. Mm -hmm. And to do something well, you have to practice it. And they get to do that. They're, they're called upon to make decisions, to meet in groups, to give speeches. And, uh, I mean, one example that comes to mind is Valerie Davidson. She's now the Commissioner of Health and Social Services. And she was the first chair. Um, she was the chair of the first Elders and Youth Convention. I can remember, as a matter of fact, that our, our cameraman, when we were covering AFN that year and talking to her as a sort of a teenager, he had the worst crush on her. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good memories. Well, you know, we're going to continue our conversation on the web because there's lots more to talk about AFN's agenda, some of its history. But uh, this next story has nothing to do with AFN, but I, I'm sure you've been around long enough to be familiar with Canadian throat singers. Yeah, <laughs> it's remarkable. I mean, the, just the breathing, I would get lightheaded. And I'm amazed at what they can do with their throats. Well, we have a pair of throat singers from Ottawa that we're featuring. They recently performed at the Alaska Native Heritage Center's Circumpolar Music Celebration. And we had a chance to visit with them and learn about Katajak. <laughs> Throat singing is primal, yet full of complexity. Throat singing was lost, almost lost. Kathy Kettler and Kendra Taguna carry on an art that somehow survived the missionaries' ban on throat singing. Throat singing has sort of made a revival in Canada and a lot of young people are starting to do it again. The songs are ancient, traditionally sung by women to pass the time when the men were away hunting. Often a playful competition, a vocal staring match. And we look at each other's mouths to see uh, some of the changes that are happening. Like not only are we listening, but we're also watching. Trying not to get tripped up. The leader is throwing sounds in that you're not expecting. And sometimes they're strange sounds and you just can't help it but burst out into laughter. <laughs> laughter. <laughs> a cherished part of throat singing, <laughs> which sometimes mimics the sounds of nature, <laughs> or just plays with words, <laughs> riffing on nonsensical phrases. So in translation, that would mean poor little puppy. 
at times earthy, even silly, but at other times profound and otherworldly. It's spontaneous, so there's like an adrenaline that I feel when I throat sing and um, almost like a rush you get after a really fast song. <laughs> Kathy and Kendra say when they channel the voices of their ancestors, they feel with every breath. The strength of their culture. The vibrations from throat singing were also used to soothe babies who were carried on the women's backs, snuggled inside their parka hoods. And speaking of traditional garments, up next, the story behind the cuss book. KTVA's Sierra Stark shows us why they are a showcase for beauty and creativity. But first, Alaskans sharing the joys of wearing a cuss book. I just want cremation. Cremation specialists in Alaska. Can I have a service before cremation? Our staff is committed to serving your needs. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Specializing in simple cremations. Whatever your reasons are for choosing cremation, call Cremation Society of Alaska, 277-2777, or in the Valley, 373-8627, and on the web at alaskacremation.com. Join Pink Elephant Splash and Dash Car Wash Express for the 2015 Breast Cancer Challenge. Help us raise $20,000 for the Breast Cancer Detection Center of Alaska. During October, Pink Elephant will donate $2 with the purchase of a premium lava wash with our all-new state-of-the-art equipment designed to get out the worst of Alaska's dirt and grime. Help the all-new Pink Elephant win the Breast Cancer Challenge on Old Seward, one block north of Diamond. Pink, Pink, Pink Elephant Car Wash is a wash. We can see it. This day has never been closer. Today, thanks to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, hundreds of thousands with blood cancer are living a normal life. We're almost there. We're making cures happen. Join us. Good morning, I'm Megan Mazurik. And I'm James Gaddis. Well, I came to Alaska to fulfill my dream of finally working on a morning show. It's the one thing I want to do. When I got here, it was just a, a man and his dog. Now I've got a few more priorities, a few more responsibilities. Life has changed for the best in ways that I, that I never imagined. I knew this would be you know, one of those trips, one of those life-changing ventures coming up here, but I didn't think it would be anything uh, as fulfilling as this. The cuspuk, also known up north as an atikluk, never goes out of style in Alaska. Now, mine was made by Margaret Heron and Bethel, and joining us in a beautiful handmade cuspuk of her own, KTVA's Sierra Starks. Hey, Rhonda. Well, the cuspuk I'm wearing is an original by Bridget Klein. Now, Bridget says as long as cuspuks are the go-to garb for AFN, she'll be in business. You can tell by the steady hum of her sewing machine, it's busy season for Bridget Klein. I'm working on a short cuspuk. Bridget is gearing up for the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention in Anchorage. She's aiming to make 30 cuspuks to sell. I can make a short one in two and a half hours. She learned the craft as a teenager. 56 years ago, this picture was taken. Watching her mother in St. Mary's on the Yukon River. How many children is that total? She had 12. Decades later, her mother's technique lives on. Regular size, it's about this size. Bridget's dining room table actually doubles as a cutting board. I don't need a ruler. I've got my hands and my body to measure. If uh, someone's arms are a little longer than mine, I, I adjust when I'm making the sleeve. Every snip and every stitch 
is Bridget passing on a piece of her culture. I've probably made thousands. One cuss book at a time. These are modern. They came after the yarn was introduced. At the Alaska Native Heritage Center, we spend some time appreciating the cuss book's history with Teresa John. It's a malachayak. It's a um, waterproof hat. She teaches college courses in Alaska Native culture. Teresa reminds us. Before the cusp book came the parka. There's 200 ground squirrel in this one parka. So after the introduction of the fabric to the region in Nelson Island, the women started putting cusp books on. The garment itself dates back to the 1800s. Here you see the Books worn by men. But Teresa says her fellow Nelson Islanders didn't get their hands on fabric until the 1950s. That the women um, can fight for. <laughs> yeah. Photographs and display cases show the evolution of the garment, from traditional to modern. Once Teresa begins explaining the details behind her custom-made cuss book, I ordered, special ordered this cuss book from my friend Lita Jimmy Galga. It becomes clear. She's actually wearing her Yupik history on her sleeves. The red specifically represented the, the bloodshed of our ancestors, of our people. And the black represent the time of depression from war. The cuspooks Bridget makes now are a little different than the ones she grew up wearing. Cuspooks made from flour, flour sacks, sugar sacks. But she says the garment has survived generations. My granddaughter's first uh, Christmas cuspook I made for her. She's six years old now. And that makes Bridget's busy season worthwhile. An original by Bridget Klein. Been collecting photos from around the state of your cuspics, putting them in an online photo gallery. You can find those photos on the Frontier section of KTVA.com. Simple design, but so much diverse. I know. <laughs> Amazing. Well, tell us a little bit about what role cuspics play at the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention. I think a perfect example of that is Teresa John, who we talked to. You know, she plans to wear her father's cuspic to, um, to AFN. So, you know, it's embroidered with his story and all of the stories. He's one of the, the late Yupik elders. So. Very revered. Yeah. Paul John. All right. Well, we want to thank you, Sierra, for giving us an appreciation of this beautiful tradition. And we want to thank you for being a part of this week's conversation, one that reminds us that the discovery of one frontier, as with AFN, often leads to many more. And as always, may you find your own frontier. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.